yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I want to talk about probabilistic CFD and evacuation simulation for life safety assessment today. And um, we know the conventional, conventional safety concept that we use is um, the available safe, safe egress time over the required safe egress time must be obviously greater than one. But usually we also um, use safety factors, which are usually chosen between uh, two and three. And we can see that the whole problem involves a lot of parameters um, within. But the question that arises if we actually use that methodology and use those empirical safety factors, is that overly safe what we do? Or is it too optimistic? We don't really know. Does it provide the same safety level as it deemed to satisfy codes? That's the question that uh, we usually have to answer for the HFJs, AHJs. And um, we also want to know how fire protection barriers, like, for example, sprinklers or detection systems, influence the safety level that we have. And we don't want to assess that um, just by saying it does influence, but we want to try to quantify the influence. And to answer the question, are they actually worth the investment? They cost a lot of money, so do we actually get any benefit out of it, any quantifiable benefit? And the client is usually going to ask, is my life safety design really cost-benefit optimized? Are you really giving me the best solution? And if we talk about risk or risk-informed design, we usually talk about probabilities on the one side and consequences on the other side. So we have to answer the questions, what are the consequences if life safety design fails, and what is the probability of failure? Well, looking at the consequences, it's kind of easy, because people are either delayed in their regress, means they, for example, walk slower if they can't see anymore, or, which is way worse, they're severely harmed and even incapacitated by the fire, which can ultimately lead to death due to smoke, heat, and so on. And the quantification of the consequences in monetary terms well, there are some models out there, like, for example, the life quality index model, um, the mortality rates, lost life years, and so on. But data is not really available out there, and it's ethically questionable, be questionable because I don't want to be the one saying, well, if I don't use a sprinkler system, um, I save more money than actually having two people die. So um, I rather want to look at the, side, the probability side of the whole thing and use comparative design, saying, how does my solution perform compared to the deemed to satisfy solution? So is my design better or worse than what's generally accepted out there? And for that, we do probabilistic reliability analysis. Um, in order to do reliability analysis, first we need a state function, which is um, very simple here because um, it's just the available safe egress time minus the required safe egress time. And uh, we also need a failure domain, in this case, omega f, which is the state function uh, if it falls below zero. And you can see here that's the, a normal distribution. In this case, I just assumed the convolution is normal distributed. And the, uh, the failure area is actually the area below zero, which means that the required safe egress time becomes greater than the available egress time. And I also want to find the design point, which is zero, because that's if in, uh, in terms of like my, my optimized solution. That's the solution. Um, w w which I want to find, because if I go on the right side, I'm overly safe. If I go on the left side, I'm not safe anymore. And in this uh, state function, x is a vector of uncertain parameters. For the um, evacuation side, that might be the pre-movement time, the walking speed, number of occupants. And on the fire side, I might have the uh, maximum heat release rate, the fire growth parameter, for example, the time to one megawatt, or the alpha parameter, and my yields, for example, the suit yield, the carbon monoxide yield, et cetera, et cetera whatever you want to think of. And um, in order to compute the available safe egress time, we usually use very complex and expensive, numerically expensive numerical tools, like, um, for example, computational fluid dynamics. For the required safe egress time, we use more or less complex evacuation simulations, and also we have additional delta Ts, like, for example, the warning time and um, the pre-movement times. Looking at the uh, reliability analysis, there's uh, a lot of algorithms out there, but there's a lot we can't use in this case because the classical form algorithm is not applicable because it needs explicit limit state functions. And what we have is, is implicit because we have to utilize numerical tools. Monte Carlo is not applicable because we need a high number of simulation runs, and that's just not possible if you want to use CFD. And the classical least square response surface method, meaning you um, do some support points and then just fit a linear polynomial to it might uh, be too coarse 
and um, not, pre, uh, pre, not have uh, accurate results, or if you add more and more um, polynomials, you actually have overfitting. So for that, we developed a fast and accurate response surface algorithm, which is not based on linear regression, but it's um, based on so-called interpolating moving least squares. They provide a fast surrogate, and it's locally accurate. And um, adaptive importance sampling to solve the actual reliability problem on the surrogate. And this actually allows for um, utilizing complex numerical tools with a, with a reasonable accuracy and within a reasonable time. So in this case, we only need um, several tens of runs instead of several thousand of runs. And as they are each independent and they're not uh, in any way like dependent on each other, we can um, parallelize them on high performance clusters. And um, more information is given in the paper, including all the equations, but I uh, thought I was just going to leave them in the paper because they are kind of complex and you might want to have a look at it if you have more time. I just want to show you a little example here. This is um, a, 200 square, a 240 square meter medium, small to medium size assembly building, which is uh, code compliant with the German codes. We have a little bar area, bar tables, a dance floor, a code room, and some restrooms. So it's, it's well, think of it as your local disco discotheque, little bar, whatever. Um, the analysis that we did with a probabilistic CFD, uh, we used, C for CFD code, we used the fire dynamic simulator, and the evacuation tool is FDS plus, plus EVAC, which we heard earlier. The thresholds that we use is uh, the visibility uh, in terms of optical density of 0.1 per meter, and I also applied a low-pass filter in order to stabilize the numerical results because they um, were very unstable, meaning um, yeah, you, you know the results when they come out of FDS, they, they are going up and down, and that might be due to numerical issues, or, and that's why I tried to stabilize them in order to stabilize the surrogate. Then I use, also used the uh, fractional effective dose. And in this case, I used the threshold of 1.0 because I already included lump sum for the irritant gases of 0.3 because at the moment we can't simulate them. And the stochastic modeling that I uh, applied is based on the literature to a certain degree, but um, I have to admit partly it's an educated guess because uh, data is absolutely missing at the moment. So that's uh, really something we need to work on. Um, two scenarios were considered um, loosely based on what is um, yeah, what, what, what's given in the NFPA 101, which actually requires no T-square scenario. I used T-square scenarios. One is a, a fire in the bar area, which was in the, uh, in the upper right. And I used a T-square fire with a linear incubation phase. And I, used, I also used an ultra-fast fire, just considering the T-square fire. And you can see it here. Um, this is from, from uh, fire experiments. And you can see here, this is the ultra-fast fire. And this is the actual experimental data. And you can see that there's a, always a little incubation phase. So I considered that, because otherwise um, it, it is very conservative to use the T-squared scenario for life safety. And um, the fire protection barrier I analyzed was an automatic detection and alarm system. And I modeled that by just um, reducing the, the warning or the pre-movement time from 180 seconds to 90 seconds. And this is obviously an assumption. And the failure probability of this automatic detection and alarm system is 10%, which is given in the British standard 7974 to work as designed on demand. So that is a 10% failure that the system does not work as designed on demand. And um, for the sensitivity analysis, I try to keep it as simple as possible, linear and rank correlation analysis, um, and then doing the t-test or stepwise regression, which is also very easy. You can find the equations in the paper on any math book, and um, which kind of gives us answers to the questions, what parameters are important, which are not, and uh, which can we actually omit, because if I reduce the dimensionality of a reliability problem, then um, I can definitely re reduce the computational time that I need. And uh, this is the results of the uh, sensitivity analysis. You can see that the fire growth parameter, in this case alpha or TG, has the uh, highest influence followed by the, num uh, followed by the pre movement time and then followed by the number of occupants. Um, for the optical density, the uh, suit yield played a very important part, and for the FED, um, threshold, the uh, hydrogen cyanide yield played an important part. Um, what I then calculated are the per hostile fire probabilities, meaning um, 
if, if you just calculate it, you assume that there's already been a fire. And you can see these probabilities are actually really high. For the buffer, it's, it's about 70% failure, but that just means that the visibility of around 10 meters is underrun before the last person has left the room. For the FED value, it's around 5% with a bar fire, and for the ultra-fast scenario, it's nearly all the time the visibility is underrun before the last occupant has left the, the, um, the, the, the bar area, and um, for, the, for the incapacitation, it's about 15%. But as I said, that's, that's the, those numbers uh, seem very high, but they are per hostile fire, and if we want to look at the usual reference period of one year, which is uh, commonly used in, in civil and fire engineering, um, we have to assume a fire probability of occurrence, which is approximately 2% per year, which is a simplified assumption also from the British standard. And also we have to consider manual fire intervention, because um, if there's a fire within a bar, somebody might actually just grab an extinguisher and, and put it out. And that's also around 50% from the fire statistics. And so we can compile that into um, an event tree, and we can see here the fire start, the manual intervention. If the intervention is successful, well, the fire is out, so that's not a problem. And if the intervention fails, then we actually go into our calculated per hostile fire probabilities, and then you can see um, we added some zeros behind the, the, the decimal place, so it actually goes down a little, but um, this is the per annum uh, probability of failure, and these are actually the probability of failure if a fire has started and manual intervention has failed. So if we want to um, look at the, um, how the impact of a detection and alarm system impacts the safety level that we calculated, we just rerun the model with the reduced warning and pre-movement times, and we do that by um, adding an additional sub-event tree to the, the uh, previous event tree, and um, it looks like this, and basically the correlation effects between, um, for example, fire start, alarm, and so on, are modeled within the scenario. So in the horizontal direction, we can just uh, multiply these elements, and in the vertical direction, it's a random walk, means it's, uh, it's, it's a totally random if a barrier fails or if it doesn't fail, so you can sum them up. And um, this uh, simplifies the calculation of the event tree by a lot. So the results, again, per hostile fire with and without detection system are shown here. You can see if the um, detection system is added and functional, the uh, probability goes down from about 70% to 21% in case of a fire and in case that the manual intervention failed. And for the uh, incapacitation, it goes down from 5% uh, to about 2%. Well, we also have to consider the 10% failure that I mentioned earlier, which is, again, an assumption, and it's pretty conservative, I guess. But... Um, in order to do that, we have 90% where the system is actually working. So in 90% of the cases, we can use this failure probability, and only in 10% of the cases, we have to use the 70%. That means in total, we have about 26% failure for the visibility, and for the FED, we have about 2% failure. And that includes already a 10% failure of the alarm system. And again, per year, reliabilities here, um, go down to 0.0013 for the visibility compared to 0.0034, which it was before without any detection system. And uh, for the FED value, it's uh, 0.0001 compared to 0.0003. And um, while the absolute values, the per annum values, um, have to be treated with care, first of all, they are not comparable to what we usually use in there if we design for structural reliability, for example, if we want to use the Euro codes, that's not directly comparable. And what I also found out is that um, whatever threshold I use, whatever parameters I use, whatever models I use, whatever scenarios I use, it's very highly influential on what I actually get as a failure probability in the end. So um, if I want to do a comparative design, I have to use the same thresholds, the same parameters, the same models, and so on. Otherwise, I just cannot compare it because it, it'll be totally different. If instead, for example, of a visibility threshold um, of 0.1, I use 0.2, the, um, the failure probabilities might be entirely different. And that's why I call them operational probabilities of failure. And usually, I see them as very conservative because usually when I start designing in a probabilistic way, I have very conservative assumptions in the first place. And um, what I can get out of it, though, is a comparative design. 
meaning for the visibility, I have an increase of the safety of affected 2.6 for the bar fire and even 2.85 for, um, for the bar fire and the FED criterion. And that already includes the 10% failure of the system. And as I know the costs of the system, I know the costs approximately at least, I can um, compare that to other systems. I can try to model sprinklers. I can try to model a smoke and uh, heat extraction system. I know the cost, cost of those systems, and I can compare it. And that means I can actually find the cost benefit optimal solution for the particular, particular problem that I have. And um, in conclusion, we have a quantitative risk-informed design using those highly complex numerical tools such as CFD and uh, um, like agent-based evacuation simulation. This is possible with the response surface method that I just presented and which is also in the paper. But unfortunately, accurate data, scenarios, and models are still missing. But, and that's the good side about this, engineers tend to be rather conservative about many things. So even if I try to assume distribution functions, I usually do that on the conservative side. And the calculated probabilities are operational and thus are likely to be very conservative because I said I have very conservative assumptions in the first place, so my results will also be rather conservative. And um, if I now perform extensive calculations, if I do that a million times on on various um, building geometries with various systems and so on and so on, I can actually quantify the current deemed to satisfy codes. I can give a number. What are we accepting at the moment if I fulfill all my, um, uh, all my requirements from the codes? And if I have those safety levels, I can then go back into my design and validate non-code compliant designs because I can say, well, I use the same models, assumptions, and so on for the, for the code compliant design and that is the safety level, and then I apply that to a, a building which might not be compliant and see, is it the same safety level? Am I, am I too conservative? Am I over it? Am I under it? And so on. And um, the effect of fire protection systems within that framework can be objectively considered, and it can com be compared to, well, find this cost um, benefit optimized solution. So I don't have to go in with a gut feeling, say, I know that this system might be better than the other system, but I can actually compare it. I can put numbers to it and say, well, this is better and it costs less, for example. And this is a, it's a great benefit from the probabilistic analysis that we have. And in the future, I don't know if I can do it still in the, in the time when I'm at the Institute, but there might be a chance of actually deriving a probabilistic safety concept, meaning that I put um, safety factors to some parameters and then can say, well, this actually fulfills my reliability requirements. So that might be interesting, but I guess that's something I have to do in the future. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Randy. Hi, so you made the comment that you had to use this uh, low-pass filter to, to smooth the, what, what data was it that you were smoothing? Was it temperature or? The, the visibility, the optical the visi density. The visibility. So, and then you made the comment that the, it could have been fluctuating because of a lot of numerical errors or something. So, I mean, do you have a basis for, for saying why you think it's numerical error rather than physical fluctuations? Well, it might be both, but it's not helpful for the response surface design. Meaning that um, if I have strong fluctuations, I can't really fit a surface to it. And in reality, it, it, I mean, it, it doesn't matter if it goes up and down within a second. Um, what, I, what I need. No, I, I get that for, you, for what you're doing. I just want to caution the, the speculation that there's this wild numerical error that in, in the calculation without having a, you know, some kind of an analysis to, to say what type of fluctuation it is, whether it's a numerical or physical fluctuation. 